We began our journey into the human brain here on the campus of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. I'd come to meet one of the world's leading brain scientists, Mike Gazaniga, and a man he's worked with for over a decade. A man with two brains. You've been working a long time with Dr. What, Gazaniga? 14 or 15 years. Huh. Just, it doesn't seem like that long, does it? <laughs> well, like the collaboration began when Joe had surgery. And you had this procedure to, uh, uh, to correct a, a, an epileptic problem, yes. is that right? Trying to stop the seizures. I was having seizures like every day or so, or sometimes two or three a day. To control Joe's epileptic seizures, a surgeon severed the connection between the two halves of his brain. Cutting the corpus callosum like this prevented the spread of the electric storms that caused his seizures. But it also prevented the left and right halves of his brain from communicating with each other. In the years since the operation, Joe's epilepsy has been under control. He now earns a living at an egg farm and in his everyday life, he's largely unaffected by the fact that his left and his right brains work independently. Do you feel any different when you think about something than you did any differently no. from the way you felt before the, the procedure? No. It's just got a backup brain, that's all. That's, all. <laughs> <laughs> that's something everybody could use, right? <laughs> I found out how true that was right away when I was asked to draw a different shape with each hand. In a brain like mine, roughly speaking normal, okay. at least all in one piece, the left half of my brain controls the right side of my body, while the right brain controls the left side. Oh, no. But because the two halves are connected... <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> ...getting each hand to work independently isn't easy. Well, we're seeing the, the fact that... Uh, <laughs> that Alan's hemispheres are connected yes. and that the uh, motor messages from one are confusing the motor messages in the other. I was just drawing an upside down duck. <laughs> okay. But when Joe is given the same task, his two hands operate as if controlled by two separate brains. What's happening is that each half of Joe's brain is given a separate instruction. He's asked to fix his eyes on the cross in the center of the screen. Anything flashed to the right of the cross goes only to his left hemisphere. Things to the left go to his right hemisphere. Because the two don't communicate, each hand does only what its half of the brain sees. Wow, look at that. <laughs> it's really like two different people doing the same task. That's right. Same that's, right. that's the idea. Okay, Joe, uh, I want you to keep your hands out in front in of In an you. experiment that's now a classic in brain research, Mike Azaniga, over 30 years ago, used a similar setup to find out if the two halves of the brain are specialized to do different things. Ship. Joe is being flashed a word only to one half of his brain. Words flashed to the right... Storm. ...are seen only by his left brain, and Joe can report seeing those words just fine. Piano. Good. Good. But when a word is flashed to his right brain... Didn't see that. Okay. So I'm going to ask you... But now watch what happens. To draw that with your left hand. I think I'm lost. Why don't you try drawing another picture of it over here, if that will help you. It's almost as though somebody has given him a secret communication. That's and right. Now he knows that, that it's a telephone. But up until then, he was blind to it. Exactly. When Gazaniga first did this experiment, it instantly proved that the ability to speak resides almost exclusively in the left hemisphere. Not until he sees what his right brain is drawing is Joe able to name it. He said church to him. After looking at the picture. Yeah. But he had to figure out about as long as we did. That's really interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a picture here of somebody communicating almost with another person. And the communication is not occurring inside the head. It's occurring out on the piece of paper. Yeah. Blob. Blob. I really don't know. You want to draw a little bit more? So far, Joe has been seeing only one word. Cat. That's a cat Things get sound. even stranger yeah. when he's flashed yeah. two words, each to only one half of his brain. The right hemisphere saw toad. Yeah. And so his left hand draws a toad. So there's the toad. Oh, it's a toad. Right. And this time I was now, able to guess what was coming. Will, it, will now, we'll put a little three-legged stool in there later or what? 
Joe's speaking left brain saw a stool. Saying the word lets the hand that's controlled by his right brain in on the secret. That's great. <laughs> that's really interesting. And if he had seen that with, with the corpus callosum intact, he would have drawn right. a toadstool. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, not a toad, a toad and a stool. stool. Right, exactly the point. I've been doing this for 35 years. Yeah. And, and, and it, it, it gets it, me every time. It, yeah, yeah, it, it must. It must. This time, instead of naming the word, I want you to point to the word. Again, Joe sees two words simultaneously. Bell goes to his non-speaking right brain. Music to his speaking left brain. When asked to point to a picture of what he saw, he chooses Bell. But when asked why... Yeah, why'd you pick that one? Use it. Music. And when asked to explain... It was music and bell, and it was a few minutes ago, the last time I heard any music was coming from the bells out here. Uh-huh. Banging away. So the, the bells yeah. outside here? So, look good enough answer to me. What's extraordinary is that Joe's speaking left brain concocts a plausible story of why he pointed the bell, even when some of the other pictures more obviously represent music. Gazzaniga believes this determination to find cause and effect, this desire to explain, is the left hemisphere's most marvelous property. One of the unique things to the human brain is this need to interpret why two events occurred. What was the antecedent of this? What caused this? Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine that a, that a species like us that has that little chip in its brain that asks those questions is going to survive rather well, because it's going to figure out more about the nature of the world than a, than a species that doesn't have that. Okay, Joe, uh, I want you to keep your hand... But as I was about to discover, the right brain has a very useful survival skill all its own. What do you think will happen here? So for you, we're doing a live experiment. Never done it before. The experiment involves the 16th century Italian painter Archimbaldo, who made faces out of fruit, flowers, meat, even books. From other research, there's reason to believe that the ability to recognize faces is located exclusively in the right hemisphere. So Mike wondered if Archimbaldo's paintings would look different to each of Joe's two brains. So will his left hemisphere say, I saw a potato, I didn't see a face? And will his right hemisphere say, I saw the face, and not comment on the fact it was made out of a potato? You're going to see a figure followed by a choice of two words. <laughs> this works. It'll be terrific, but we'll see. So here it is, live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. The first painting goes to the right hemisphere. And Joe points okay, to face. Point down. The next painting goes to his left brain. And this time he points to fruits. Mike seemed pleased. <laughs> Are you having a moment? <laughs> Again to the right brain, and Joe sees it as a face. Point it down. But to the left brain. Face made out of books. Point it up. Point it to books. Are you happy with what Fruit. you're seeing? It's unbelievable. He's doing it. You see that? He, it's good to going so fast, it's shifting from left to right so fast, I can't keep up with you. You're when, used to looking at this. When you show him a face in the right side, the left hemisphere. Yeah. He's focusing in on the elements that made up the face. Yeah. And, uh, when you show him the exact same picture in the left field going to the right hemisphere, he's focusing on the face and not the elements. And not the elements. If you came down from another planet and you saw faces and vegetables, mm -hmm. you might not think there was much of a difference among them. But the brain seems to be made up in a certain way to say, Faces are very different from other objects. That's right. And one side of the brain specializes in faces. Right? Exactly right. Exactly right. It is an adaptation that we have to detect upright faces. It's a very important. You can imagine in an evolutionary time that all of a sudden you have the ability to detect quickly an upright face. You want to read the expression on that face. You mm -hmm. want to know if it's friend or foe. You want to have a set of questions about that face. The right brain might be skilled at recognizing faces, but when it comes to what gives the human mind its power, the ability to reason, to invent, to interpret the world around it, Mike Gazzaniga's 30 years of research has taught him which hemisphere he wouldn't want to be without. The old phrase around our lab is don't leave home without your left